and uh, we 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 will be uh, we will be kind of making a schedule, right, Ola, for the coming one. Yes. Do we already have a date for the next one? No, we 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 don't. We can uh, discuss that maybe uh, at the end of the yeah definitely our hour. Maybe okay. we we spare ten minutes at the end to discuss that. That's fine. Yeah, it seems we have now. I can't even see how many participants. Seventeen. Say seventeen. Ah, okay, that's. But it's 17 plus all the others that I see here, but maybe it's 17. Well, um, let, let us uh, slowly start. And um, I think someone already records the session, which is very good. Announcement to everybody, this session is being recorded. Um, first of all, okay, first of all, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining and uh, immediately after this welcome, my apologies that I scheduled this first um, Wacheningen AMD uh, seminar webinar today where we have holidays in Bangladesh and the Philippines and probably other parts of the world. So <laughs> uh, I, I was not aware uh, when I suggested that date. I'm very sorry. And next time, I hope we will uh, make a better choice of the date. The more I appreciate everybody uh, who made it today. Um, and maybe then as a very brief uh, introduction. Um, so I think people and most people know me. My name is Ole Sander, uh, working with Erie and leading the Asian Mega Deltas Initiative, and we have uh, since the beginning or since uh, before the beginning of the initiative actually uh, had uh, discussions um, with Wageningen University and research um, and specifically uh, a program on um, water and food uh, that uh, yeah, we, we saw a lot of alignment in terms of, 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 of interest. interest. Please mute yourself if you're not muted. Um, in terms of interests, geographies, uh, and so we started <clears throat> last year um, co-hosting a site event at uh, COP27. Uh, we had a joint uh, session at the Gobeshina conference. Uh, and now, uh, when uh, I had the chance to visit uh, Katarien at ba in Wageningen earlier this year, we said, OK, why do we not uh, really initiate uh, a joint uh, exchange uh, of, of uh, yeah, research results or ongoing work uh, between AMD and uh, Wageningen interested people from Wageningen University? Uh, and so this is now the first uh, of those uh, seminars or webinars. Um, I think this is this is really just a uh, yeah a, a, a first pilot at the moment. We can uh, adapt to whatever uh, may work better in the future. Um, and if we all agree this is a terrible idea, we can also stop it at any point of time. Um, so that's just a very brief introduction, and it's I think it's a it's a good chance to really have a bit more exchange on a more scientific and and uh, yeah level of on the ground. Katarin, do you want to add something, please? You're muted. Yes, I muted myself when. <laughs> OK, this is a very uh, Olaf. Thank you very much for for this introduction uh, nothing to add to that. I'm very pleased uh, with this, uh, this interaction. Um, uh, I think it's very useful to maybe give a short introduction to the Wageningen uh, part of the research. Um, this is part of our strategic research. Uh, on food security and valuing water. And then in particular, I'm leading a team on um, focusing on deltas. And our particular focus is on 
uh, salinity and drought at the moment. Uh, overall, we follow a food systems approach. Uh, I think uh, Fidos will say something in his presentation about that. Um, and um, we do that because we are with uh, researchers from different disciplines and we like to be able to talk uh, together. So we, we, we were looking for a common concept uh, um, to work in. And then we also um, uh, are looking at changes uh, in agriculture and, and wider. And so for that also we want to interact with different parties in the society. So also we were we we are looking for ways and means how to do that. And when talking with Ola and Catherine when they were visiting, uh, it's very clear to us that you are working on similar um, approaches. Uh, and um, it, it, it needs exchange uh, in order to learn from each other. And the faster we can learn, the better it will be because we have a SDG2 that is behind and some other SDGs that are linked to it as well. So uh, for that, um, uh, though it was a bit short notice, uh, we uh, found that Feroz is very happy to present about the field work that we are doing in Bangladesh. We also have field work in Vietnam, maybe another time about that more. Uh, and we are linking also to the international level, uh, for instance, uh, with the uh, UN Water Conference, where we also had a link to the CGIR, though not the Asia Mega Deltas, but in the wider sense, um, uh, Kuntala was uh, part of our um, program there. Um, and so we see that the, we, we need to move up and down between the different levels and see how we can share and learn faster. It also means that the work that Feroz is presenting is not a kind of uh, beautiful um, uh, uh, result uh, already. You really will see work in progress. Um, so please keep that in mind. But uh, again, for learning together, we thought we should do that. So having said that, um, I, I think uh, uh, Ola, we can move to the presentation first. Yes, please. Uh, I mean, you introduced uh, Feroz already, uh, our first speaker. We agreed that we try to have that alternating one speaker from Wageningen, one speaker from uh, AMD uh, and Wageningen offered to start. Uh, generally, I think so we have uh, about 15 minutes or so for the presentation, plus minus, and then maybe another 25 minutes or so for discussion and then uh, maybe we have 10 minutes to plan for how we want to organize it in the future. So, yes, please, Feroz, introduce maybe yourself uh, in a bit more detail and then go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, I'll uh, start by sharing my screen. Let's see if it works. Usually the technology sometimes is uh, a bit complicated. I hope you can uh, see my screen. Yes, we can see it. So then I will start the presentation. Can you see it now? Yes. In presentation mode, yes. Yes, so then I will continue. Uh, so um, yeah, I'm Firoz, Firoz Islam. Uh, I work with the team here with uh, Catherine, Judith, uh, Vincent and Hacker. Uh, we are part of uh, water and food team of Wageningen Environmental Research of organizing an university and research. Uh, today I'll be talking about like uh, vision of farmers on salinity in Bangladesh. So yeah, uh, just to introduce myself, I work uh, in a winner uh, water and food team as a researcher. I'm a hydrologist. Uh, I'm a hydromorphodynamic modeler. Uh, for now I'm working on hydrological models, soil water atmosphere plant swap model, LPG ML model, salinity and agriculture. I have a master's in uh, flood risk management and I have a PhD in uh, water and sediment management from Utrecht University. But today I will talk about food system approach, transition pathway, field trip that we recently had in May in Bangladesh and uh, where we uh, talked with the local farmers and uh, we'll talk a bit detail uh, later on. And uh, planning for the future uh, this year and beyond. 
So first, food system approach. As we know, the deltas, uh, like other uh, areas in the world, is rapidly changing. So the agriculture and food situation in the deltas are also changing. But for example, uh, like in case of Bangladesh, uh, the food system is always or mostly focused on uh, production itself. So more production, but uh, only focusing on production is uh, not enough anymore. We need to take a look at uh, a, a more holistic approach, so a balanced approach. That's where the food system approach comes in, which takes into account not only the food safety, so not only the production side, but also the environmental factors such as uh, equality and equality of income, equality of benefits and socioeconomic factors, um, uh, sustainability and resilience and a safe and healthy diet. But future itself is uh, changing and very uncertain. Uh, for example, if we take a look at uh, the city of Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, where I live most of my life, I've seen it grow rapidly and uh, exponentially. It's it's growing at, at such a rate and such a way that it's very difficult to predict how it look like it will look like in the future. So future is always uncertain. So long term planning is always required. But even if we know in the future where we want to be, we need to know how can we get there. So how can we get there step by step? That's where like uh, black backcasting comes into play. So now we're here at present. And we want to be here in the future, but we need to think about how can we get there step by step. So that's one of the things that we wanted to talk with with our local farmers in Bangladesh uh, during our recent field visit in May. So the objectives were uh, that we would gather knowledge on the farmer's perspective on impact of salinity now and the future and uh, what kind of future do they envision and how would they like to get there with step by step? Uh, it had three sessions. Uh, we had three workshops. So each workshop had three sessions. In the first session, we asked the farmers to talk about the impact of salinity now. In the second session, impact of salinity in the future. And in the third session, we asked them what kind of future do they like, would they like to have and how would they like to get there? We wanted to uh, talk about these kind of things in uh, different sectors. So what are the general information, how the agriculture sector, livestock, shrimp will look like, and what will be the impact on drinking water as well and health as well. Uh, but also when we ask them to uh, talk about their envisioned future, like the future they would like to have and how would they like to get there, to make it more comprehensible uh, of the time scales or the time step, what we ask them like, OK, what would you like to do now? What would you like? What would you like to do in 10 or 20 years for your next generation? And what would you like your grandchildren do to achieve that goal? So we had these workshops in southwest of Bangladesh in three different locations. So locations were selected depending on the level of salinity. So low, medium and high. The location close to Kulna, workshop one, was low salinity in Botiaghata. It was medium salinity and in Rampal, it was high salinity. And the landscape was a bit different as well. Close to Kulna, it was close to a urban city center. And in Botiaghata, it was inside a polder. But in Rampal, it was outside of a polder, still a very rural area. And in all these three workshops, we tried to have gender balance in participation. We tried our best. So uh, during our workshops, we not only talked with the farmers, we also saw that the farmers are uh, also adapting and they are getting quite uh, used to different technologies as well. So here we see a lady who has uh, this EC meter and salinity probe and the farmers use information from her. Uh, through a crop calendar to decide which crop they should grow depending on the level of salinity. And then here we see uh, there are some experiments going on uh, on how to do different crops and which would do better in higher salinity level. So when we talk about the current situation, current salinity situation, there are differences in all sectors from different uh, salinity levels of the farmers. So uh, especially in uh, low salinity to medium to high, 
what we see is that okay at low salinity salinity high only during the summer season in the medium salinity region it's also in the summer region but as well as the end of spring as well but in high salinity region the salinity is high throughout the year we also asked the farmers okay so how do you know it's getting saline or it's very saline so what they told us is like okay we just test the water from water bodies and it's saline we see it we test it we see the plants dry, dying we see the leaves dying so we know that salinity is getting higher and one thing that i haven't added here was a very interesting fact that they informed us that okay when salinity is very high they go to a water body and disturbs the water body at night then they can see reflections and then they know salinity is really high so i i'm not quite sure how that works out but for in my mind i think it's uh, due to maybe density differences or something but it shows like how local knowledge is also very important uh, like how local uh, people actually perceive different kind of things for agriculture in so low salinity region they see that the salinity is uh, becoming challenging for irrigation for uh, rice culture and vegetables are damaged as well but when you move to more saline regions like medium to high saline in medium salinity region they already say that okay irrigation uh, during the high salinity season is not possible with the surface water we need to they do the irrigation with very deep aquifer groundwater uh, they said like uh, 700 feet or something they have uh, the boring at different depth and then they also do uh, rice tolerant uh, salt tolerant rice crops which uh, are being suggested by a dae department of agriculture extension and bangladesh there and they know that the vegetable production is not really good during the saline season so what they do they do vegetables just for themselves to use so in their gardens or something or uh, backyards but for the high saline season uh, like when salinity is very high and nothing grows there so the seeds do not germinate crops do not grow yield is very low only some vegetables grow there really and for irrigation they really have to buy the water from somewhere and bring it there for uh, irrigation or they use rainwater harvesting uh, so three different scenarios and three different lifestyles i would say but for livestock what they all agree is that okay so with saline water the livestock actually get sick so like the, the cows get sick and there is also becomes shortage of food so feed grain and other things but the thing is when you go from low saline to medium saline they already see that the, okay uh, the the paddy the straw from the paddy that we are growing is not enough for the cows but they still have some uh, a bit of grass but for high salinity even the grass don't grow so for them like uh, feed for the cattle is very very difficult and that region we actually measured the salinity uh, when we were there uh, it's it was like 14 or 15 ppt quite high but all of them actually see the opportunity okay with the increasing salinity maybe fresh water fish will not be possible but shrimp could be possible but they are also aware that the shrimp can bring uh, uh, risks as well because uh, there are cases of diseases in the shrimps then you lose your crop as well drinking water is another thing that impacts all of these regions but in a different way so for low salinity there is a shortage of drinking water during the uh, summer season or like uh, the saline season high saline season so then they uh, buy water from uh, a bit far away but the thing is here women actually carry the water home and the, the ladies actually see that the cookware also get damaged due to high salinity in the water but they still have access to drinking water in medium salinity they already start to do like rainwater harvesting and that's even not enough so they have to buy water from far away and then uh, there is also in that water they have problems with iron and arsenic so it's a bit challenging for high salinity season region it's even more challenging and then they see that okay uh, we cannot use groundwater because it's already saline and then they have to buy water from far away but then even with that water children might have diarrhea as well so when we ask the farmers okay you go far away but nearby what do you do nearby 
So what they do, they take a look at different ponds that they have throughout the village and try to figure out which pond has the lowest salinity level and then take the water from that pond and then filters it and try to drink that. So Rose, it's you are at about 10 minutes, so you need already? to speed up a bit. OK, OK. OK, so uh, I, uh, then uh, about the future, how they, do they see the future to be? All of them sees like, OK, the salinity will be high. Uh, the striking thing that was for me is that, OK, salinity level of salinity higher is a bit different as well. So uh, what the low salinity farmers see is like, OK, uh, rice production nowadays may in Bangladesh we do it three season, maybe it'll go back or go uh, reduce to single season. But in the medium salinity, they already see that rice production will be hampered throughout the year and yield will be lower. And high salinity, they say that, OK, maybe a crop will not grow anymore. And the salinity will move more inland. So, OK, that's good to know. For the livestock, the situation will be even more dire with the drinking water problem. But what they see is that, OK, if they don't have livestock, they will have shortage of milk, eggs, and uh, protein as well. They see that with OK, increasing salinity will bring like uh, opportunities for crabs and shrimps. And drinking water will still be challenging, but there we also see a different perspective of different regions. So the low salinity region, they don't mention a lot about like uh, the treatments, but the medium and high salinity regions, they already have experienced some sort of treatment facilities. So they say that, OK, treatment for salinity, so desalination will be needed in the future. But as the salinity will increase, the diseases will increase as well. So there will be health issues uh, for all three regions. And when we ask them, how do you see, uh, like envision a future where you'd like to be? They all say, OK, we would like the salinity level to go down and uh, lower salinity levels where we can do crops, where we can do vegetables, where we can have our livestock. But the people in the medium salinity level, they actually kind of surprised me saying that, OK, we know that the salinity level will never be like a freshwater level. There will still be salinity. So we agree to live with the salinity and ad adapt to it with the latest technologies, maybe adaptive crops, adaptive cropping patterns and different kinds of things. And when we ask them to think about step by step, so what they say in the first step, we actually need to plan it well. We actually need to have a long term planning. We need involvement of uh, government institutes and NGOs and together we should plan. In the next step, they say we need to educate our uh, next generation and they should know about different technologies. Uh, different crops and everything and adaptation measures, but they still would like them to do at least sustainable sustainable agriculture. So they want their future generation to still be involved in agriculture, at least for sustenance. For the next next generation, they want them to be more educated and more involved with technologies, but still do agriculture. So what we see here is that, OK, they see that the agriculture practices will become more and more difficult, but they still want to be in the agriculture practices at least for sustenance. And when we were in the field, we saw that the situation is very difficult. There is high salinity in the field. Uh, the river beds are going up, but still people are adapting to it. So they are growing like vegetables close to the banks of water bodies where they have access to the water quickly. They are uh, doing rainwater harvesting. They are doing drip irrigation with pitchers. They are doing mulching. And uh, this is one example of using solar panels to use uh, to run a desalination plant, which were installed by DPHE in Bangladesh. So there are a lot going on and people are trying to find a solution. So for the planning for the future, uh, what we are doing now in uh, this year, we are working on identifying salinity hotspots uh, around the world at global scale and also at local scale in Bangladesh. At national scale in Bangladesh, we are working on subseasonal to seasonal forecasting project where uh, a bulletin is provided to the farmers uh, to what to do depending on weather forecast. And we're working on trade-off and synergies in food system. We're trying to develop a tool to see 
how different uh, indicators impact each other. Uh, we are planning to have a workshop on salinity future in ICWFM 9 conference in Bangladesh in October. At local level, we're working on uh, salinity perception of the farmers just like this, and we would like to link our research to CJ research. So uh, then I come to the discussion points uh, to actually discuss like whether salinity is actually part of your research. And if it is, do you collect uh, field data and how do you collect field data and where do you do it? What are your field locations? And uh, will there be field work in recent future? Uh, yeah, so uh, that's about it. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Feroz. Uh, Was I'm I on time? <laughs> I'm handing to uh, to Ola for the to facilitate the discussion. Well, also thank you very much uh, from my side. Uh, yeah, I'm also thanks that you uh, put up already some uh, potential points for discussion. Maybe before we get to that, I would ask if there's if there are any questions from the audience to you. Um, you can just raise your hands, and we can uh, then you can unmute yourself and ask your question. If you have problems with your internet connection or don't want to speak for any other reason, you can also type uh, your question into the chat. And both has been done already uh, by Mike. So Mike, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thank you for us. Uh, an interesting presentation. Uh, and of course, what's happening in Bangladesh is also happening in Myanmar and the Ayawadi Delta and in the lower Mekong in Vietnam. So my question is, have you or has the government of Bangladesh looked at the possibility of adopting genetically modified crops which are already available like rice, uh, salt tolerant rice, um, shrimps, Metapaneus vanami, for example, which tolerates a range of salinity between 15 and 25 parts per thousand. But there are uh, breeds now which will tolerate even more salinity. The same with fish and same with other crops. I don't know about livestock, but I imagine that somebody somewhere is genetically modified goat, modifying goats and cattle for their resilience or tolerance to higher levels of salinity. So my question is, would this be acceptable in the to the Bangladeshi government and the Bangladeshi people? Uh, thank you, over. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Thank you for the question. Uh, so yeah, when we were uh, talking with the farmers, especially in the medium salinity region, uh, they were saying like the Department of Agriculture Extension in Bangladesh. They are uh, always uh, communicating with them and sometimes they're also providing uh, salinity tolerant uh, rice seed or varieties for them as well. Uh, to my knowledge, there are a lot of research going on on uh, salinity tolerant rice varieties uh, in Bangladesh as well in Biri. Uh, so and the farmers, what they told us uh, during these workshops are, is that they are willing to adapt not only to a saline tolerant rice, they are also willing to adapt to different cropping pattern as well. If rice is not possible anymore, they're willing to adjust to do it, do something else as well, as long as they can produce something. Uh, about the fish, they see the opportunity that, okay, with higher salinity, you can maybe will be able to do some uh, shrimp culture and some uh, crab or something else as well, but they are also worried a bit in a sense that uh, like, okay, previously there were some um, talk about shrimps having viruses and stuff and losing the crop. So uh, they're also worried about that as well. And for the livestock, I I haven't heard about any like salinity tolerant variant, but I think the challenge here is also the food for livestock, the feed. So even though grass is more saline tolerant for higher saline reason, even grass doesn't uh, don't grow there. So uh, yeah, I think uh, feed will be a challenge for livestock as well, not just for like uh, yeah, what do you say, the cattle, 
but maybe even for the uh, like uh, chicken or even duck. Thank you. Thank you for for the response. Let me add maybe that I'm not aware of any genetically modified salt tolerant rice variety. Uh, I'm not sure if some of my colleagues are, but I think generally there are very few genetically modified rice varieties that are available. There are there is indeed a lot of research going on on uh, improved uh, rice for salinity tolerant. It's not as straightforward as uh, one may think, and but probably more straightforward than breeding for uh, salt tolerant uh, goat species, I assume. Just, just, um, Ola, just to add to that, the Chinese claim, and I have not, no means of verifying the claim, that they have a genetic, genetically modified breed of rice which will grow mm -hmm. in full strength seawater, 35 parts per thousand. As I say, I, it's it's a claim. It's out there on the internet. I've I've not seen it. If it's true, it will be very interesting. But it mm. does come back to the question, the, the level to which a population or a government is prepared to accept genetically modified food. In, in the UK, for example, it is acceptable, but many sections of the community are against it and demonstrate actively against it. In Europe, I think it's again, it's balanced. Some are happy and some are not. Over. Indeed. We have more questions or comments. Bandari was first. Yeah, thanks, Oli. I think uh, you already answered, which I wanted to uh, answer a few questions. So in terms of uh, genetically modified, uh, China is working on some research, but uh, in Bangladesh, uh, there is no uh, variety on the genetically modified uh, rice. Iri is working on the golden rice in terms of uh, genetic modification, in terms of adding uh, vitamin A, uh, but still uh, it's not approved by the government. So there is, uh, it's, the GM crop is not well accepted. Although there is already released, uh, the brinjal is released, GM brinjal, but uh, after that one, no, no other crop has been released in terms of uh, GM. But in terms of improved rice varieties, there are eight or nine uh, salinity tolerant rice varieties already there. And then there are few uh, varieties which can tolerate up to eight or nine DS per meter, uh, which is salinity level. But uh, that's in the low or medium saline. They can still produce a good amount of uh, good yield. And also there are some hybrid varieties which perform quite good uh, in terms of salinity condition also. But for the high salinity, IRI is working and recently we found some germplasm which can still survive in 12 or 13 DS per meter, which is very high salinity. So IRI and BIRI are working together in terms of developing some new varieties. Uh, so that's just the uh, some feedback in terms of this uh, other issue. The uh, livestock is quite important in the south, and then because of the salinity, estro, and then fodder production is one of the big challenge. And uh, that's why if we can uh, develop some sort of when we talk about the food system, some of the opportunity in terms of fodder production or the straw management, uh, some that. So it would be very good uh, for the livestock farm. So, and uh, I heard that Ikara had some uh, very good uh, alpha alpha saline tolerant variety. And also there are some uh, salinity tolerant barley varieties. This will be good uh, for testing uh, in the coastal area. Thank you. Just feel good back. Thank you very much for the input and comments. Uh, Dr. Yen. What's the next question? Yeah, thank, you, Ole. thank you, Ferris, for your very interesting information. We are doing similar work in the same area, so this uh, information from your presentation support a lot for our work. I have uh, one question for your uh, slide number nine. Uh, here uh, we see that uh, Santoran rice is, uh, is um, uh, prioritized uh, for the media medium salinity barriers. 
but I see in the low salinity periods, uh, the salinity is the biggest challenge for rice. But why is it the sun tolerant rice is not uh, selected here? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the saline torrent variant and everything actually in Bangladesh, as far as I know, it mm. works in a way that the Department of Agriculture Extension, they introduce these kind of things to the farmers or uh, they inform the farmers with this kind of uh, uh, information and practices, then they pick it up. So in the medium saline region, uh, it was introduced to them with the Department of Agriculture Extension. And uh, for the low cell line, I think they still have access to quite fresh water for irrigation, even during like a bit of saline region, salinity season. So maybe that's why they are not uh, using the salinity, but it's my guess. I actually didn't ask them why they don't do it. So uh, that would be my guess or yeah, my opinion, I would say. Yeah. But good question indeed to ask. Thank you. Stefan, please. Thanks. Um, just a quick question. Uh, it's going along the lines of, you know, having these solutions outlined. Uh, do we have an inventory either, you know, across all the efforts jointly? We also have uh, on an inventory of uh, solutions that are sort of say ready to go and certain high potential solutions uh, that we would then be able to map against you know, uh, a, a gradient of salinity uh, so that uh, we can capitalize on the information that you have already collected, but that uh, we also look at what can we learn from what's out there. Uh, if that has been done, great. If not, then maybe that's that's a priority over. Yeah, personally, I would say I, I am not aware of uh, such a uh, document or uh, something. But what I would say that when in the field, we actually saw that the farmers have, uh, especially in the high saline region, that they have a crop chart where they can go to and figure out at what saline level, which crop does better. And uh, uh, in the picture, I showed like one of the ladies so who had this EC meter. He, uh, she was hired by the farmers or she is paid by the farmers to uh, test the salinity table in the beginning of the season to know which crop will do better and then take a look at the crop calendar and then decide which crop they should do. And the farmers also uh, do the tests uh, mid season as well to know whether the salinity level is low or high or they have to do something. But that's what I've seen in the field. So uh, yeah, maybe the others who are more knowledgeable men than me and working on this more longer, maybe they know if there are such documents available. Can I add something? Because I, I think it's important to note that uh, the crop chart and the lady measuring, this is still a project context. So it's not a kind of standard uh, procedure yet, uh, but, but it's, it, it looks very promising. Um, and um, at, at the other point about um, whether efforts and potentials are already listed, um, we didn't do that uh, in our research, but it might be that in AMD that was done. Uh, so I'm kind of asking Ola, do are you, or maybe Humnat knows that, uh, whether in the AMD something like that was done. I would say not yet. Umna, do you know if if that has been done outside of AMD in the seal folder? Yeah, in the seal folder project, uh, we did a lot of uh, survey. What are the choice for the different technology and then what are the different solutions? So based on that, what are the crops? What Where is the market? Even if the crop is there, whether there is market or not. So the, that type of exercise has been done for the seal polder project, but that's only for the Kulna, not for uh, uh, low PDM and high salinity area. But maybe it's interesting if, if you could share that to us, uh, then we can kind of look into the matter also because we will be going again. Yes, yeah. sure. Thank and you. Can I ask, 
all three of you, are you do you know if there's uh, if there's a kind of systematic mapping that has been done or is ongoing in terms of uh, salinity levels in in normal years in extreme years? Uh, yeah, is is there any kind of of mapping there so that we have an understanding of where can we expect what kind of salinity levels? Okay, whom that first? Yeah, there is uh, the um, SRDA called the Soil uh, Research uh, and Development Institute, or SRDI. That's the working on the soil related things, and they do the, the current and then future projection of the salinity level, what will be in the future. So that projection is already there until 2050, or I don't know exactly, but future projection is there. And um, even in the seal polder project, we do uh, recording of the salinity level and the different months uh, over the past five, six years. So where, which month there is high salinity, which month is the, it declined. So all this uh, information we have uh, recorded in the uh, seal polder project as well. Across the delta or only in? No, only Wally. in Kulna. So that's mm. only in Kulna, uh, but uh, SRDI has done all the coastal zone. That's the future projects. So that's yes. more comprehensive and then uh, informative yeah. code in terms of decision making. Feroz, would you like to add to that? Uh, yeah, so uh, my uh, I actually not adding, but I might ask like uh, SRDI, are they measuring like uh, soil salinity or water salinity or something? Because uh, I know like uh, in GDP 2100, uh, IWM also had a map for salinity on maybe on water, how the salinity is now and how it might be in 2050. So uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, I know both, like the uh, yeah. both uh, soil and water salinity, they project both. Nice. <laughs> and these maps are available? Yeah, I put already? I put a link to the SRDI portal in the chat. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, that information is also used in the Bangladesh Delta Plan. So it's very kind of government approved information. As far as I know, it's mainly focused on the soil related salinity and not as much the water related salinity. IWM has done some water related salinity modeling, which has been published um, with World Bank, uh, where they made projections for the future, which explains very much why the area around Kulna Shatkira is far more saline than the area Potuakali uh, Borishal. Uh, so, so that's a very important difference along the coast. Um, uh, and um, at the moment in, in Wageningen, there's also a PhD from PSTU, from Potokali Science and Technology University, who is uh, looking at salinity in that Potokali Borishal area and who has done measurements at different depth throughout the year at different moments. Um, and that's what I know about um, measurements and, and I think there is a, a, a lot more to do there. Um, measuring can always be done at the kind of uh, global level. We are now trying to kind of see whether we can with other global modeling we can get that to kind of get a grip on what global hotspots on salinity are because if we can do that with modeling then we can also model the kind of future hotspots um, so that's work in progress. Uh, and the other thing is that there is a difference on knowing at the national level things and knowing at the local level things also with regard to the future. So for the farmers, it might not be that they want, they know like eight or nine PPT, but uh, still it will be interesting to kind of match the dis different kind of knowledges together. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Also, thank you for the link. Uh, Mahesh, please. Thanks, Oleg. Uh, thanks, Virus, for the presentation, which is which is quite interesting. 
I have the same question, anybody monitoring on water and soil salinity, and you asked that. Thanks, Kathleen, for that information. And uh, to go back to that uh, crop information thing, uh, I was wondering if there any information on crop yields actually, how with the change in seasonal salinity and also change in the, if you look at the low salinity areas, high salinity areas, what the crop yield uh, change with respect to the rice and also how the salinity impacting the crop. And the other question is, is anybody monitoring groundwater there? Suppose farmers are using this saline water or the, from the canal and how that's impacting the groundwater salinity or the saline inclusion mixing together, how that's anybody is doing that. Just one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so first of all, about the rice production and everything. Uh, so as far as I know, uh, in Bangladesh, like uh, uh, the Minister of Agriculture uh, publishes yearbook every year, which uh, uh, gives information on how much rice is produced in different districts. And also like Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, they publish, uh, I think also yearly basis, like how much production is going on. But uh, relating that to salinity, in my opinion, would be a bit challenging in a sense that the, the measurement for the salinity is not continuous or it's not available publicly. So I would say it's uh, not like these two hasn't been uh, compared together because uh, the measurements are not uh, in my opinion, in, according to my knowledge, is not continuous or not available. So if the measurements are there, I think this can be done. Uh, but also, uh, it's difficult to assess whether the impact of salinity was high or low, because if the farmers actually switch to saline tolerant rice variant, which actually offsets the reduction of uh, rice uh, production, then it's difficult to see, OK, what salinity has been impacting comparing just these two data sets. Maybe we need the cropping pattern data as well, like, OK, what kind of crops were there? Uh, that's one thing. And about the modeling, so I know uh, maybe IWM does some model on like uh, national regional scale level with the groundwater and maybe with the uh, surface water, but I'm not sure whether they combine these two, not at least for salinity, so not for ion transfer. As far as I know, they might be combining these two for water levels and this kind of things, base flow and others but not for ion, ion transfer as far as I know. And at field scale, I don't think it has been done. But like the research uh, that Catherine actually suggested, uh, the researcher from uh, PSTU, Portofolio Science and Technology University, he actually, I think, did a bit of modeling uh, with the swap, uh, with using his, the measurement data that he collected, uh, salinity at different levels. So that's uh, as far as I know. Does that answer the question, Mahesh? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Peter, for the information. Yeah, we will explore more actually. Yeah, on this part. Yeah, I, I would be very. Oh, I would. Yes. I, oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but it would be very interesting to hear from the AMD um, on your side who is actually the person who is most kind of working on salinity uh, in Bangladesh in the AMD from the water angle? It's, a, it's not so easy to answer. Oh, OK, um, then yeah. answer have, later. That's fine, that's fine. No problem. No, we have, we have, we have uh, kind of, I would say, three main contact points there. We have uh, the work package on agronomy is looking at uh, agronomic practices and, and better agro um, agricultural systems for to adapt for salinity. That's uh, led by Robert, who's not here, but I think also Bandari is involved there. Then we have uh, work on salinity risk mapping, uh, a participatory approach uh, that has been done by uh, Katie and Yen uh, and Chang in a different work package. It's more um, supposed to support planning. And then we will uh, start uh, work uh, on more modeling related work, uh, which you are aware of, uh, done 
in two different uh, two different aspects of that done by Wachening and, and Imi. And that's uh, now I'm not sure Mahesh would that be I forgot who's the main contact point there from Imi. Is that you Mahesh or? Kathy, Kathy is in the call. Ah, yeah. Yes. Is he here? I think no. he's in. No, no absolutely. So. Okay. No. Okay. Does that answer? Yeah, you know, I, I have an answer. I, I have a question. Sharing yes, please. Jahan, please. Uh, 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 Firos, thanks actually for the presentation. Um, I just want to know, you know, uh, what I saw during your presentation is that with actually the farmer perceptions. But during your visit, did you discuss with the extension agencies like DOF, like DAE, like Department of Livestock, any discussion with them, local level, any discussion with them? Because when I discuss with these different agencies, I really find a different kinds of views from different persons. If you ask a Department of Fisheries officials, they always say that, okay, salinity is good for us. What's the problem? Because why you want to grow everything everywhere? Salinity zone is good for shrimp. We can go for shrimp in this area. So, you know, if you ask, Department of Agricultural Extension, they are coming up with different solutions, you know, based on your, because diversity of the food system is, you know, is also required. Uh, but really a consensus among these extension agencies is needed to make a comprehensive plan to address the salinity in that area. And I think, you know, from the field level, this perception kinds of thing. We know your uh, your presentation gave us some new idea, but you know uh, many people are also doing this in this area. But really, uh, if you want to think about a uh, you know sustainable plan, uh, you need to add those agencies and and to look at how we can actually integrate these results, how we can actually make a joint plan to address these issues. So this is very important from my view. Uh, because different people has different opinion there, you know, it could be something really, really sustainable solution for sustainable solution. Thank you. Maybe a short response. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, so when we were in the field, we actually uh, talked with the, like, uh, officers from Department of Agriculture Extension. Uh, that's where we came to know that they were uh, introducing or informing the farmers about uh, different saline tolerant variants and also uh, they promoted like uh, the mustard seed uh, production in the high, high saline season this year. So we did talk with some of them and during my PhD's work was also on the uh, southwest delta, southwest part of Bangladesh. And I actually saw that the different agencies see the problem in a different uh, lens, lens. So yeah, I think there is a consensus is uh, needed, of course. Yeah. OK, thanks. I, I'm afraid we have to. I think Catherine wants to say something urgent, but I think we have to kind of come to a close because we uh, wanted to discuss the uh, the future plans. Uh, AMD will organize a side event on salinity in deltas during the International Rice Congress uh, in October this year. So maybe that is another chance where we can uh, continue the discussion or go a bit more in depth if people attend. Katarin? Yes. Um, uh, uh, well, the point I wanted to raise was that I fully agree on the, the point on the consensus that is needed. It will be interesting in that regard to reflect at a later moment the research that was mentioned that you do uh, with the participatory approach on and the risk mapping and to see if that could help in that regard uh, and 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 maybe uh, well if you are not already in touch with uh, government at various levels uh, I would be very willing to help also with our network uh, in case that would help yours though I think you have a quite good network there with whom that's coordinating the Bangladesh case overall with regard to the uh, you mentioned October, the IRI conference. Uh, th that will be very great if you can raise this the flag on this topic there. 
uh, I very much look forward to hear more about that. In Bangladesh, there will be the ICWFM9, the International Conference on Water and Flood Management. And we are in touch with the organizers for a session on salinity. Um, and um, uh, I will follow up with uh, Humnat uh, and you, uh, Ola, on uh, how to kind of reflect from AMD also in that session. That would be a great opportunity also to link. And that's also in October, correct? Yes, 14 to 16 October. So we can have a, a rowing uh, event starting in Dhaka and then moving to Manila. Yes. And then following it up, also linking to the work we did for the UN Water Conference to kind of bring this also to the international level yeah. to raise the flag that a lot of work is, is needed. And of course, we do our research work, but we already can identify more questions. So maybe we should wish to work on a knowledge agenda for this. And then separate from that, also other organizations, World Bank, ADB, are involved in implementation projects. And yeah. uh, we, we need, that's kind of difficult because Either it goes from agriculture and then it's not integrated or it goes from soils and then it's not integrated or it goes from livestock. So you see that's that's quite difficult to get it um, embedded in implementation as well. Yeah. Fully agree. COP28 is also coming up. Another opportunity. Uh, we have three minutes to uh look into the future so first of all i'm very happy that we had around 30 participants today despite holidays so that's very good and uh, an indication that there's interest and that we should continue uh if anyone objects please uh, let us know immediately um from our side we were thinking of having this every four weeks um would that work? And so first of all, maybe the timing. Is the timing OK for you? Yeah. And then maybe in terms of frequency, we were thinking of every four weeks and then alternating between Wageningen and, and AMD speakers. Um, and then, but I mean, the main point is the discussion later on, I think. So would that, would that work? Uh, every four weeks so that that would be now the where's my calendar? Twenty six July. I just put it in the chat, uh, Ola. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Does that work? And then we can maybe create a regular event in the calendars every four weeks. Yes, and we can make a schedule so that also some people can say, "I would like to present," and then uh, we, we we can communicate. So people know it a bit further in advance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. We can create a, a, an agenda maybe for the rest of the year where people uh, ask to present already. Mm -hmm. It question, also doesn't have to be strictly alternating. I mean, it's just yeah, very and well. Because we will run out of time soon uh, and people will need to move. I want to thank everybody. Uh, one question is, can we expand to more partners in the chat? Stefan asked that question and I would be in favor that we Anybody who would wish to join can join. Is that okay with you? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I think then we are going to say our goodbyes. We can also, I mean, at some point, maybe next time we discuss that, if we make that really a bit more public and advertise that more, more widely, these Delta I think thoughts. that's a good idea. Yeah, okay. Then we lose a bit of the, of course, of the you no know, bilateral discussion between yes. Wageningen and AMD. Uh, so it will be a bit on a different level than maybe the questions. We, we will experiment and if we think we lose too much out in the discussion because we are too many people or not uh, uh, free enough to talk, uh, yeah. I, I think people could feel free to give us feedback that I missed this part, let's go to that, because we can then also alternate. We can have kind of some are for everybody, like every quarter, and some yeah. are internal. Yeah, let's very experiment. Good. Very, very good. I'm all for it. So 26th of July, next time. See you again. And we'll, we'll identify someone. Have a okay. good day.
day, everybody. Thanks for joining. Bye. 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 Have a good day and Eid Mubarak. Bye-bye. Eid Mubarak to everybody. <laughs> Bye.